Okay, so why don't we go ahead and get started and um, got the CERTAs and us here live together via Zoom and um, there's some cold issues or al allergy issues going around the CERTA household, so they'll be muted probably the whole time. Uh, but we're glad to have an opportunity to, to join together again uh, for the, this time of Bible study. And if you're joining us via YouTube, I, I'm glad you get to join us as well. I hope that some of you will get to join us here via Zoom um, so that we can we can have some more interaction. I, As I've said all along, I want these times to be more dialogue than just merely monologue. Um, but it, I know it's more convenient for folks to join via YouTube, but I'm glad if that's the only way you can join, I'm glad you can do it that way. Um, so what we want to do tonight is we're going to finish uh, our discussion, hopefully, hopefully we'll finish it tonight, our discussion on how to study the Bible. We started that last week, part one. Um, actually, we got about part three quarters, and we'll finish part one tonight, and then we'll hopefully cover all of part two. Um, so let me open us up in a word of prayer. Then I just want to say a few um, kind of introductory comments, and then we'll jump into our study for tonight. So join me in a word of prayer, would you? And Father, we once again are just so grateful we have this technology uh, that even when there's sickness, we, even when there's illness, even people are traveling, they're uh, unable to, to come together at this time, they can still uh, log into this Bible study via YouTube and we can do this via Zoom from our homes. Father, thank you for that. Lord, we do want to lift up uh, Reuben and pray that uh, this sore throat that he's got, Lord, we pray you would just put your hand on him and heal him and Take away that pain. Father, keep it from becoming any worse, whatever this happens to be. And, and Father, we just thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your word. I thank you that we can come together. We have the freedom to do that. What an amazing thing. We can open your word. We don't have to fear. We don't have to, don't have to worry about someone breaking our door down for studying the Bible. Thank you for that freedom. Lord, thank you for giving it to us. That you, we can know about you uh, through what you have revealed in your word. And so, Father, we pray for your blessing on our time tonight, as your spirit leads and teaches and guides uh, us in our time together tonight, Father, we just pray we be responsive to you. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so just, just a couple of things before we jump into um, kind of picking up uh, how to study the Bible. I wanted to talk a little bit about why I started this way uh, with this particular uh, pastor's Bible study looking at first lesson at what is the Bible, um, and then looking these two lessons, uh, maybe one more, but these two lessons at how to study the Bible. Paul said this uh, to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. If you or your children are in Awana, and you can quote this from memory, gold star for you tonight. Uh, but this is what Paul said to, Tim to Timothy. He said, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who doesn't need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. And one of my objectives with this Bible study, in fact, is one of our overarching objectives of the church, is to be disciple makers, being disciples who are making disciples. And so I want to use this time not just to teach you some of the, the great truths that God has for us in his word, but I want to equip you. I want to teach you how to do that, how you can look at a passage of scripture and you can pull out some of those golden nuggets of wisdom yourself. The Lord may lead you one day to, to lead a Bible study or to lead a home group or, or Sonia, I'm not sure if you're on tonight, but as you prepare children's ministry lessons. I want to give you the tools that you can look at a passage and you can pull out the main idea. You can, you can build the lesson yourself. I, I, want to, I want to equip you as disciples so that when the Lord moves you on out of Aviano, you, you are, you're a little more equipped, a little further along in your walk with him than when you got here. And so to that end, I'm going to throw this out there as an offer, not going to be a requirement, but certainly as an offer to say, I want you to consider maybe leading one of these studies, maybe just one session, not the entire thing, but just one session. 
taking some of these principles and when we move into the start digging into one of the books of the Bible that you might even lead one of these studies you can put some of these tools and some of these principles and and uh, and and practices into practice prepare the lesson and you would lead it now I'm not going to just throw you out on your own and say there good luck figure it out um, we would spend some time connecting together uh, reviewing the principles again um, and helping you build that lesson so that we could you know you, we could adequately prepare you so you pray about that you think about that um, and you know as we were talking about on Sunday um, don't let the fear of failure keep you in your comfort zone it should make you a little nervous the idea of leading the Bible study the idea of teaching from God's word should make us a little bit nervous. You know, that's why we started where we did, talking about what we have with the Bible and, and the fact that this is the very word of God given to us. And when we have the opportunity to open that, the opportunity to teach from that, that should make us a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit nervous. But don't let that fear keep you stuck in the safe, keep you stuck in your comfort zone, and keep you from stepping out and stretching. So I want you to think about that. We'll circle back to that periodically, and I want you to think about um, raising your hand and say, yes, I'll lead one of the lessons. Um, the other thing I want to just mention again is we will likely finish up tonight with these introductory lessons. What is the Bible? And two, two parts on how to study the Bible. We'll likely finish that up tonight. And so I want your thoughts, your input on what we're going to do next. And, you know, maybe it's a particular topic that you say, hey, could, can we talk about this particular issue for several weeks? What does the Bible have to say about this particular issue? Or maybe it's a particular book of the Bible and you say, you know, this is where I want to start. I've always kind of wanted to really dig into this, this book um, or, you know, God's really been speaking to me about this book or through this book. Can we spend some time and really just kind of pick this apart verse by verse, phrase by phrase? Or maybe they're a question. They're kind of these hot sort of perennial questions that you have. You know, you know, I've always wondered about this, or this is a question that comes up in my mind or in church periodically. And uh, you know, can we can we do that sort of a, a got questions kind of thing? Where you you know give me give me questions, and then we'll spend some time over several weeks working through them, looking into the word, see what it has to say. So I want your input, you in the YouTube audience. I want your input as well. And so. Let me just open it up right now. I know, Ruben, you can't talk, but you can type a, a message. Um, do you have any initial thoughts about where you would like us to start next? Is there a book of the Bible or a topic or a questions uh, series? What are your thoughts on what you would like us to do next? Let me open that up for questions for here on the Zoom audience. Uh, for those that are joining us via YouTube, um, either send me an email if you don't have Facebook. Um, or just post your thoughts, your input there on the Facebook post where you caught the link for this video and let me know what you think and what you would like to see us do next. So does anybody have any thoughts on where you'd like to see us start? Unfortunately, I don't have anything specific. Um, I like studying, you know, certain books of the Bible and learning the history behind them. And, um, you know, to me, that's always interesting, but I also really enjoy like life application studies, um, uh, you know, different topics, different. So I'm kind of no help at all. I will participate <laughs> in anything. <laughs> well, thanks for nothing, Amanda. That was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> No, no, that's that's that is helpful, and and I, you know, I have some thoughts because I because I that is eventually where we're going to end up is just taking some books of the Bible and let's just open them up and and pick through them. Of course, we will talk about the the history and the and the cultural setting and all of those things that go into it. Um, but and eventually we we will we will do that, and maybe where we start. Um, but I just want to get a sense. Um, of where everyone wants to begin. Reuben said, is there enough information about the apostles, their personal background, history, um, and related to the scriptures? And that might be an interesting study, Reuben, for us to take a look, sort of character studies. Uh, we're doing some of that on Sunday morning, some of the heroes of the faith, but that might be an interesting study. 
um, for us to, uh, yeah, one or two at a time. Yeah, for us to kind of take a look at who are some of these people and what does the Word of God have to say about them? Okay, well, those are good ideas. And um, and so if there are some um, some other thoughts that you have, Amanda, if you do have a specific book you want to jump into or Sony, if you got one, um, by all means, let me know. Um, and again, you on the YouTube audience as well. Um, this may or may not be the time or place for it, but I've always wanted to study Revelations. I know we said that jokingly a couple of weeks ago, but I actually would not mind having someone that's been through seminary having their thoughts on that book. Okay. Um, yeah, and that's, you know, I, I joked about it last time to say, you know, that's not the place you want to start, but but that's not a bad, I, I, I don't mind doing the Revelation. Um, and going through that book, it certainly is a lot of good meaty material for us to dig into. Um, I, I have to say this up front, that if we're going to do it, it's going to take us months. Um, it's 22 chapters. And, um, you know, if we're going to move through the Revelation properly, uh, it's going to take some serious time. And, and that's okay. I'm not afraid of doing that. I just want us to know that up front, that that wouldn't be a six-week study. That would be more like a six-month study um and so certainly we can do that um but just we'll have to kind of know what, what we're wading into before we wade into it ruben i'm not sure if you typed a message there it just came across as a square on my screen so i'm not really sure what that is but you want to open it up i didn't see what it what it was so if if it's an emoticon or something i'm i'm not okay there it is Scared cat <laughs> Yeah, the Revelation is a is a challenging book, but I, I think it's one that could be um, it could be very beneficial for us to dig into. So we'll put that on the list, Amanda. We'll think about that. Okay, so but let me before we jump into finishing um, how to study the, study the Bible Part One. What are a couple of the principles that we talked about last week? Remember, we kind of went through some of the principles for study. Um, what were a few of them? You can name them all, but what were a few of them? Stunned silence on the other end. And that's, a, you know, I, I was afraid when we got to the end, because we were running short on time last time, and I kind of blew through them. And so I... I was a little bit concerned that maybe I blew through them too quickly. Um, so I don't want to go back and reteach it all from last week, but let me just kind of hit them real quick. And then, then I, want to, I want to talk about problems with interpretation. What are some of the common problems? Some of the principles for study. Uh, first of all, looking for the plain meaning of the text. When you read it, what does it seem to say? Well, on the surface, when you, when you first read it, what's sort of the logical conclusion there? That, that very likely is the real point. You know, again, kind of avoiding the temptation of, of diving deep before we just notice what's on the surface and just notice the logical thing that's just going to stare at us in the face. Kind of look for the plain meaning of the text. Read it normally. So what that means, and we'll talk about genres here in a few minutes, but what that means is if you're reading poetry, read it like poetry. If you're reading a historical narrative, read it like a historical narrative. There's always that question of, should I take this literally or should I take this figuratively, what I'm supposed to do with this? Just read it normally. You know, recognize when, when Jesus used hyperbole and he would make these grand exaggerated statements recognize those for what they are and just read it that way second thing context 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 always be looking for what is going on here when this when this thing is is being said what does it look like the original author was trying to say to the original audience that's where our meaning is now the application will be, you know, may change over time, but the meaning will never change. What that original author intended for the original audience will always be the meaning of that text. And so we're looking for that. We talk about context. We're looking for the history. Amanda, you just mentioned, you know, it's it, it's wonderful. Open up a book of the Bible. Let's talk about the historical setting. What was going on then? 
What are some of the cultural influences in society? What was happening? That's what we're looking at, the historical context. What was going on at this time? You remember I showed you last week, BibleStudyTools.com, and where you can find that. Uh, you get a good Bible encyclopedia, you can find all of that. Also in context, we're looking for the literary context. What was said before it? What was said after it? What are some of the key words, some of the repeated phrases and stuff that are, that are used in there? We're, we're looking for those as well. And so we're looking for the literary con context. What happened before? What happened after that? Once you've got all that, and I'll be honest, the way I do that when I'm, when I'm sermon prepping is I've got the Bible open and I've got a, just a spiral notebook and a pen. And I, I, read, I read the passage, I read it, I read it, I read it. And every time I read it, I just make notes. Now, I wonder what that word meant in verse 1. When he, when he said that phrase there, I wonder what he was talking about. What was going on that caused him to say, I just write these notes down. And then, then I go back and I study those notes. Okay, let me find out what that word meant in verse 1. Let me find out what was going on that caused him to say that particular thing there in verse 5. And I answer all of those questions. And then once you've done that, remember then the principle is ask yourself, what's the point? Okay, what's going on here? What's the, what's the ch timeless truth that God was teaching us? And then confirm it. Confirm it biblically. Always allow the Bible to interpret the Bible. What we're doing is we, so we've looked at a, a passage and we, and we think we've got a good interpretation of what was going on, what was being said. And so now we're looking for other, where, where else in scripture does it speak to this issue? And in those other places, does that either confirm or refute my interpretation. And if it refutes my interpretation, well, then I must have interpreted something wrong. And so I have to go back and look, what, where did I get that wrong? So always allow the Bible to interpret the Bible. And then we move to application and apply the text today. So those are some of the principles, again, of, of how to study, how to interpret scripture. And remember, we're always interpreting scripture. That's not just for pastors to do when we're preparing sermons or Sunday school teachers or home group leaders. When they're preparing Bible studies, every one of us, when we read the Bible, we are interpreting it because we weren't there. And we have these gaps of time and culture and, and language that we have to overcome. And so we are interpreting all these. So now what are some of the common problems, though, with interpretation? Because you know, as, as Paul lays it out here in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, what God wants us to do is accurately handle his word. And so what are some of the common problems, some of the things that get in the way of us accurately handling scripture? First one is, you may have heard it called this cherry picking. Now, what is cherry picking? No doubt you've heard that phrase as people talk about scripture. What is cherry picking in the Bible? Is that when we just pick a verse and basically take it out of context? <laughs> That's exactly what it is, Amanda. You take a verse, you pull it completely out of its context, and then you start to build this sort of belief system or this conclusion around this verse that's absolutely plucked from its context in a way that, that makes it say something that it didn't actually say. For example, you've heard the phrase, Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die. And people will say, well, listen, the Bible says, eat, drink, and be merry. And so we might as well, right? There's sort of the Bible's given us license to party on, right? That's kind of the way they use it. Completely plucked from its context. In fact, Jesus said those words, eat, drink, and be merry. But then he said, but God will say to that person, you fool. So when you put that thing back in its context, you say, wow, that's not really saying at all what I thought it was telling us. So yeah, cherry picking, pulling things out of context and making them say something they never did say. A second problem with interpretation is reading a 21st century Western mindset back into the text. Remember, these this audience that were these authors that were reading 
we're writing to an audience that in the New Testament anyway, is a first century Middle Eastern audience. And they think differently than we think. They, they pursue priorities in life differently than we do. They understand things differently, have different worldview, so to speak, than what we do today. And so it's, it's inappropriate for us to read a 21st century mindset back into the text. One of, one of the, I, the thoughts I had when I, was, when I was jotting that note down was, was the idea of slavery. You would read about that in Scripture and the Gospels, it talks about it. Scripture talks about slaves. In Colossians, it talks about slaves and masters and the relationship between the two. And from a 21st century mindset, particularly some of the discussions that are going on today in society, you know, we, we look back at that and we say, why didn't Scripture condemn that more? You know, it was such a horrible thing. Why didn't Scripture condemn that? And of course, we are thinking of slavery, the concept of it, from the perspective of, for us anyway, the perspective of American history, what it looked like in American history. I said, well, that was an absolutely horrible, horrible thing. Why wouldn't the Bible take a stand against that? But we look back in slavery, for example, in the first century, it wasn't always that. Sometimes it, people had made themselves a, a servant, a slave, to pay off a debt. It wasn't always what we immediately think of it as from our 21st century Western mindset. So it is a mistake, and not only for that issue, but it's a mistake for us to read our current American way of thinking in the 21st century back into Scripture and say, it needs to adjust to us, rather than us just recognizing it for what it is. Third thing, third problem with interpretation. These are not the only ones, but some of the some of the ones I want to cover tonight. Reading your predetermined conclusions back into the text. And I got to tell you, this is one of the easiest <laughs> one of the easiest ones to do. You know, we have a, a predetermined idea of of what this text means or or what this particular issue is going to go, what the bible says about this particular issue and when we read a text we read that idea into it rather than pulling out from the text what should be there what is there we read into it what really is not there has anybody run into any of these problems any any time you have run into them heard about them experienced them Maybe on your own, even as you've studied scripture, you've run into these. I know uh, when I was like a teenager, um, I remember in, in Proverbs, it talks about wisdom and it refers to wisdom as a she and mm -hmm. she's some jewels and, you know, she is this and she is this. And as a kid, I remember reading this thing and thinking, yes, I am. Like, that is me. Like, I am a, you know, I'm a woman and I am far more precious than because I would just take one verse out, not knowing the context, knowing that it was actually talking about wisdom, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that, that kind of, you know, that, that um, wisdom language, you know, where there's sort of personifying wisdom at that point in time. Yeah, not making it a feminist thing. You know, that's not... That's not where the writer was going. Right. Um, yeah, you know, you, you think about um, in, in the proverb that says, uh, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he won't depart from it. And, and there's a sense in that, that if we're, if we're uh, ignoring context, ignoring what we're reading, the genre, for example, of what we're reading, we're reading back into some predetermined conclusions back into scripture, we could look at that and say, that is an ironclad promise. That if I train up my child right, then he will walk the straight and narrow all of his days as an adult. Now, if you've got children, particularly if, if you've got older children, our, our, our girls are all adults now. Um, and I'm not saying they're, they're bad, they're bad, uh, they're bad adults or they're bad people, but you know that that's not always the case. 
that sometimes as children get older, children become teenagers, they go into adulthood, they, they don't always follow exactly the principles that you taught as they were growing up. And you say, well, well what happened? Is the word of God not true? Did it, not, did it lie to me? But the issue wasn't about the word of God. The issue was about that I read something into that. I assumed Proverbs was an ironclad promise when it's not. It's a general principle for life. So I read something into that text that was far into the text. Um, yes, a couple of other uh, problems of interpretation. I'm gonna, I'll say it this way and then I'll explain it. Prescriptive versus descriptive. And what I mean by that is that sometimes we have to look at scripture and say, this is merely describing what happened. It's not prescribing it for all Christians for all time. And so we have to look at it and say, well, what is really happening here? And, and, and how am I to understand this? And should I see this as a descriptive thing? Let me give an example. Acts chapter 2. Um, in Acts chapter 2, so the end of Acts chapter 2, it's talking about the first church. And the first church had come together, and they were just forming right there on the heels of the day of Pentecost. And verse 44 of Acts chapter 2. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing it with all as anyone had need. Now, you know, you could, if you look at that and you say, well, there we go. I mean, the Bible says that's how they did it in the first church. That's pres prescriptive for all believers and all churches of all times, then why aren't we living in some kind of communal living arrangement? Because that's what it talks about. But it wasn't, it wasn't prescribing that, it was merely describing sort of the general attitude there in the church, that there was that much care and concern for each other, that they were willing to sell what they had to help out each other in the church. It's not prescribing it for all of time, it's just describing what took place. And then, you know, some other, an abnormal reading of the text. And we talked about that a little bit, just reading it normally. Reading Psalms and assuming that everything in Psalms should be taken literally. That's abnormal to the text. It's all that poetic language in the Psalms. It would be abnormal to read that and say, I should take every single phrase in there literally. It's abnormal. When Jesus said, if you if your eye causes you to sin pluck it out you know to read that and, and not recognize that that's hyperbole and i don't really need to go and pluck my eyes out that's not what he was really saying an abnormal reading of the text ignoring figures of speech that kinds of thing and so there there are several problems of interpretation that we just need to watch out for um, when we open up the word of god so that we don't we don't commit them so that we are accurately rightly handling the word of truth. Now, I thought we might cover tonight um, a little discussion on Bible translations, but what I would like to do um, is move on into genres of scripture, um, and maybe I'll just kind of give you the written material about the different Bible translations. Is that okay, or do you want to spend some time talking about the different translations of scripture? Sorry, what was the second option? Um, I, can, I can just type it out and send it to you that way, an email or something. Um, or we can spend the next few minutes and kind of talk through them. Um, either way, it doesn't matter. I apologize on cooking and listening at the same time. Okay, Ruben, you have any thoughts, brother? Okay, press on and get the text separate. Got it. So, so yeah. So I'll do that. I'll send the I'll send you the written text on just some thoughts about different translations, um, because that you know we talk about studying the Bible. That's the tool we're using, right? 
constantly. And that's the, that's the, the critical thing we've got in our hands. And so it's important for us to think about the different translations and what we're looking at and what do we have here and why are there so many and what's the difference between them. Uh, and so I'll send you that text um, it, when we get off of here so you can read through that. So thinking about some of the, the principles of study, um, thinking about some of the problems of interpretation, um, I want to talk for the next few minutes about genres of the Bible and background. As we come to scripture, as we come to a text or a book, what kind of background are we looking for? What kind of stuff should we be taking into account? So I want to start with the different genres of scripture. So this, uh, this is a, an English, you know, flashback to your English class back when you were in high school. What is genre? Use that word or that phrase. What are we talking about? Like a category or a topic or a theme. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. We're talking about, you know, what kind of literature are we looking at here? You know, are we looking at uh, a narrative or are we looking at a poem? You know, those, those are genres. And, and what are we, and, and those, those drive how we approach that text, don't they? I mean, they, 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 they frame how we understand it and how we interpret it. And there can be a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of misinterpretation if we're not recognizing the genre of text that we're looking at. And we have this notion that I should understand it. I used the example earlier of, of Proverbs. Looking at Proverbs and assuming we should we should interpret that the exact same way that we would interpret a historical narrative or a law text. That everything in there is just literal and straightforward. It's inappropriate to it, and that certainly could lead to some very big misunderstandings and some, and some complete misinterpretations of Scripture. So it's important for us to, to understand what genres are we looking at. So there are several in Scripture. I'm not going to go through them very quickly. I'm not going to dig into them, but I just want to go through them very quickly. There are narratives, um, and, and that's sort of a general category. There's several kinds of historical narratives. Um, you think about the book of Genesis, um, First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Kings. Those are books of history. The Bible reading plan that we're doing in YouVersion, we just started it today, um, it's going through the historical narratives in Scripture, um, just to get a sense of those. And so there's some historical narratives. There's law narratives, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. These you read through those, you know that those are God's giving His law in those texts. There, there's law narratives, and even moving into the New Testament, the Gospels are narratives of things that happened, the history of Jesus's earthly ministry. The Book of Acts is a narrative that's talking about the the beginning of the church and how that took place and how the church, how God spread the church. Those are just narratives. And when we read those, there's some characteristics of that. When we read a narrative, we can just expect a straightforward presentation of the facts, because that's what they are. That's what a historical narrative is. You open a history textbook, that's what you expect, just a straightforward presentation of the facts. And so that's what we can expect when we read the narratives. Another genre is prophecy. And prophecy is a little more tricky than a narrative, not always as, as sort of as straightforward as it would seem, but prophecy. When it comes to the prophets, particularly the Old Testament prophets, there, there's two categories of prophets. You don't necessarily need to know that for the quiz at the end, but two categories of prophets. There are major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. The book of Lamentations falls into the major prophecy, but that's just because it was it was written by Jeremiah, one of the major prophets. Now, when I call them major prophets, I referred to them a couple of weeks ago in the sermon, one of the sermons on Sunday. Um, I, I was referring to the minor prophets, but major minor prophets. What are we talking about? Does that mean that does that mean these guys are more important than the other ones? What's the difference between major and minor prophets? Um, I don't know for sure, but my assumption would be that the major prophets had more to say 
about Jesus and his forthcoming um, versus the minor prophets that may only have given a few details, you know? Yeah, in, in essence, yeah. And Ruben, you said volume. And yeah, that's right. It's, it's the sheer volume of material. That's why they call some of the major. Isaiah, for example, has a whole lot more material than the prophet Amos. So you look at just the sheer amount of stuff that Isaiah wrote. There's a whole lot more of it, a whole lot more that Ezekiel wrote than, than, um, than Zechariah wrote. So it, when you talk about major prophets or minor prophets, you're just talking about the amount of material. And so those, those are 12 minor prophets. The last 12 books of the Old Testament are the minor prophets. And we look at the prophecies. They had two jobs. Prophets had two jobs. One was foretelling future events. And that's usually what we think about when we think about prophets. We talk about prophecy. They're talking about telling the future and, and foretelling the events that will happen. But in all reality, that was only about a third of their work. Only about a third of the, the work that they did was telling the future. The rest of it was foretelling, is the way the textbooks describe it. Thus saith the Lord. You read that phrase over and over again in the prophets. Thus saith the Lord. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. And that's foretelling. They're, they're speaking forth God's word. And that was the majority of what they did. God would speak to his people through the prophets. And that's, that was the, the, the bulk of two-thirds of their work. And so when we look at prophecy, we look at those Old Testament prophets, we've got to think about which is it? You know, what are they talking about here? Are they talking about future events? Or are they talking about, is, or is God speaking about current events right now? And again, you get that with the context kind of reading around it. The book of the Revelation would also fall into prophecy, apocalyptic literature, but it falls into prophecy, a great deal of prophecy in the book of the Revelation. Another one of the genres is wisdom literature. And we talked about it a little bit earlier. Um, Proverbs, of course, being part of wisdom literature. Job is also categorized as wisdom literature. Ecclesiastes categorized as wisdom literature as well. And as I mentioned already, when we're looking at those books, um, the wisdom literature, we have to realize we're looking at general principles for life. These are not ironclad promises about how things are going to work out every single time. They're general principles that if you apply wisdom in these types of circumstances and these types of ways, things will generally work out this way. And so we have to kind of recognize that as we're re reading the wisdom literature. And then, of course, there's poetry. Psalms, of course, comes to mind immediately. Song of Solomon, if you've ever read Song of Solomon, um, you know, it, it's very poetic. And so when we read the Psalms, for example, we have to recognize the poetry aspect of it, that we can't take every phrase with absolute 100% literal application, literal understanding, because it's so poetic. We have to recognize the poetic language and let it be what it is. The other genre, and this is where I kind of want to park and we'll spend the rest of the time tonight and maybe bleed over into next week in this last one, and that is letters. A good chunk of the Bible, in fact, the overwhelming majority of the New Testament is in the form of letters. And so I kind of want us to, to pull that open a little bit and say, all right, when we're looking at these letters, 21 of the 27 books of the New Testament are, are letters. And so I think it, it's important for us to say, all right, well, if that much of the New Testament is in this particular form, then let's spend a minute and talk about some of the ways that we can approach this form and really get out of it what, what was intended for us to get out of it. So first of all, it's important to remember, I think, that New Testament letters, like any letter, are written for a reason. One author called them occasional documents. Now, that doesn't mean that we only read them occasionally. That's not what he's talking about. Um, what that means is they were written for an occasion, either to address a problem or to answer a question or to provide some information. But all of the New Testament letters were written that way to, to address some kind of concern or some kind of issue. 
And that makes them very practical in nature. When we're reading these things, we're, we're reading about real life problems that were going on, real life issues or situations or questions that the people in those churches had. And so it makes them very practical, but it also can be a bit of a problem for us in interpretation. How, can, how do you think that can cause a problem? Knowing, knowing that about the letters, what kind of problem do you think that can cause for us? I'm so sorry. I'm multitasking. Can you say that one more time? So, yeah. So when we look at the letters in the New Testament, um, you know, they're, they're written for a reason, to address an issue, a concern, to answer questions. And that's a great thing for us because it makes them very practical for us, but it can also be a problem in interpretation. And so the question is, how, how can that cause problems for us in interpretation, just knowing that about the letters? Ruben chimed in and said, church rules and family dynamics. Yeah, certainly we get that in the letters. And, and, that's, and that's a great thing because that's a very practical application in several of the letters. We're talking about church life and how things ought to function, how things ought to be organized, and how we ought to, you know, how we ought to behave within the family. The challenge with that, though, is that we don't always know the question that was asked. We know the answer, but we don't know the question. So now you, we've, we've done this at times, right? You're, you're sitting there in, in the room, Amanda, maybe Ruben's on the phone, and you hear half of the conversation. You only hear what he has to say. But in your mind, you're, you're trying to fill in the gaps. What is the other half of the conversation? What question was asked when he said that, or what comment was made that caused him to say that? Right. Yeah, and so we, you know, so that's kind of when, when we're reading the New Testament letters, it's kind of like listening to one end of a telephone conversation. And our task is to, is to I don't want to say so much read between the lines, but, but, to, but to, to do a little detective work here and try to figure out what was the original question? What question would have caused him to give that answer? What issue or problem would have caused him to say that thing? And so we have to fill in those gaps a little bit when we read the letters. We, they knew very well the problem, so he doesn't need to explain it to them. They knew very well the question, so he doesn't need to tell them again what it was, but we don't have access to that. So that does cause a little bit of a challenge that we have to uh, just keep that in mind as we read the New Testament letters. That's like, uh, you know, people always say Thomas the doubter, but if Thomas had not asked that question, we wouldn't have gotten that, you know, most famous verse that we hear all the time. So it's like, you know, I'm thankful that Thomas asked the question because then we got that information, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, we, we kind of get on Thomas a little bit and we say, oh, we, you know, we're calling doubting Thomas and all that. But, but the reality is that I, I think Thomas represents a lot of us. And had we been there in that situation, you know, how many of us wouldn't have asked the exact same question Thomas, said the exact same thing Thomas did? You know, he represents a sort of very real aspect of, of you know, following Christ, that sometimes we do doubt. And how are we to handle that? And how does the Lord handle that with him? And so, yeah, I think it's a great thing. Um, but, yeah, so we, you know, we have, kind of have to keep in mind that, listen, we're only getting half of the discussion here. And so we've got to try to fill in the blanks a little bit to get the rest of it. The other thing I think to do when we're reading the New Testament letters is think about when you get a letter in the mail, how do you read that letter? I mean, you don't, you don't pick, you don't cherry pick pieces out of it. You don't read one paragraph. With right? excitement. Yeah, with excitement. But you read the whole thing, right? I mean, you may go back and reread that paragraph that special thing that your mom said to you or your your brother said to you whatever you may go back and <laughs> ruben to check the return address <laughs> you're breaking up a little bit but i think you asked would i read the whole thing yeah yeah i mean you know you 
that, that, I mean, that when you get a letter, you don't just read one paragraph, right? You want to read the entire thing. And so you go back, you'll review that, man, that, he said something special there in that one paragraph. I'm going to go back and read that again. That really meant something to me. But you read the entire thing. And so I think when we read the New Testament letters, you know, your first, you know, when you first approach one, just read the whole thing front to back, just read it all. You know, I guarantee we think about, oh, I got to read the entire book. My goodness. They're not very long, most of them. And so it doesn't take but 10 or 15 minutes to read the entire thing. So read the whole thing. And as you do, kind of keeping your eyes open for what seems like a main theme here. What are some ideas that keep popping up? What are some of the questions you know, with some of the answers that he's providing that are that are in my mind, sort of jogging it to say, what question would have driven that? Kind of be thinking about that as you're reading through it. What are repeated topics? What are some things that get a lot of attention through that letter? Boy, there was a reason why that thing got so much attention in that letter to that particular church. Anything else that seems like it might be a significant point that, boy, he really took a strong stand there. That seems like it was a pretty significant issue. So as you're kind of reading through the entire thing, you're trying to get sort of the big picture here. And then you go back and zoom in on some of the other areas. And like I said, look for some, and we'll end here because we're just about running out of time, but, but look for some clues um, in the text to try to reconstruct the situation. Things like, um, who were the recipients? You know, who, who received this letter? Who wrote this letter to those recipients? Are there any clues in the text about what their relationship might have been? What was the attitude of the author when he wrote to them? That's a significant thing. Maybe some clues as to the specific occasion. Like I said, some of the answers that were provided. Um, some of the, the things that are talked about, the topics. As you're reading through the letter, think logical divisions, think paragraphs. You know, we look through any of the books of the Bible, remember that the chapter numbers and the verse numbers were not originally part of it. And so sometimes, most of the time, when they did the translations, they, they don't, you know, they don't change chapters in the middle of a paragraph, but sometimes they do. And so kind of be thinking, you know, if you can back away from the chapter and verse numbers and think about what are sort of the natural divisions here? What are the natural paragraph breaks? So I can kind of put this thing in these sort of natural paragraphs. Now I gotta be honest, that's more of an art than a science when you're looking through it because they're you know you could read two or three commentaries or two or three scholars and they'll they'll maybe include five verses in this paragraph and maybe you would include six or they would include four so it's, it's a little bit more of an art than a science and then as you're starting to make those assumptions make sure all of your assumptions are supported by the text i'm not reading something into this am i i'm not i'm not putting something here that's far into what the text actually says or what the situation um, calls for, make sure the, the text of the letter supports your assumptions. And then well, let me finish with this. And then we'll, what I want to do next time is um, we'll do a little exercise and we'll try this. I want you to, to think about, um, particularly we're going to try it with the book of Colossians. So I want you to think about some of these principles that we're talking about tonight maybe through the course of this week, read the book of Colossians, front to back, read the whole thing. It'll take you 10 minutes. I timed myself reading it, and I'm a plotter. I'm not a fast reader by any means. It took me 10 minutes to read the entire letter. Read the whole thing, thinking about what are some of the clues, who wrote the letter, what was his relationship to the audience, um, where was he when he wrote it? Why did he write it? Kind of thinking about those, some of those things. And we'll do a little exercise next time to do that. Um, and then, of course, you know, you will, you'll want to do a little bit of the background work when you're getting ready to study the letter. Do some of the background work. Get in one of those, 
Bible encyclopedias we looked at last time on BibleStudyTools.com, get a little bit of the, his, the history, a little bit of the culture of what was going on in that period of time when that letter was written. It really gives you a good flavor, a good understanding. Of what were some of the key issues of the day that may have driven that or may have uh, colored what was said, how it was said, and why it was said? Okay, so I know that I, as I said up front, I know that some of this material that we're talking about in these opening lessons is a little bit academic. And it might be a little bit, oh my goodness sakes, a little bit dry because it is a little bit academic. But I think it's important for us as students of the Bible, important for us as disciples to have the tools so that we can rightly divide the word of truth. And there are certain principles that apply to that. And so I hope this is helpful. And as we move forward and we jump into a, a book of the Bible study, um, you be thinking about maybe there's a, a chapter or a section in one of those books that you want to lead the lesson on, you want to apply some of these principles and try it out yourself um, in sort of a safe environment. Um, and I'll give you an opportunity to do that. We'll work together, prepare that lesson, and I'll give you an opportunity to lead it. Okay, any, any thoughts or questions uh, before I close our time out tonight? It was great, thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Well, Ruben, I hope you get to feeling better, buddy. I hope that uh, sore throat goes away soon and uh, we can hear you cracking jokes on your own. They lose a little something when they're typed in the text messages, but, uh, but I do hope and pray that sore throat goes away soon. And thank you guys for joining in tonight. Thank you for you who are joining in um, in our YouTube audience for being involved. Um, and again, if you have questions, particularly those that are watching via YouTube, if you have questions or you want to make a comment, feel free to post those. Do that on the Facebook post rather than on underneath the YouTube video, because I won't see them if they're underneath the YouTube video. But if you put them on Facebook, I'll see them and I can answer your questions there for everyone. Okay, so let's let's end our time in a word of prayer and get back to enjoying our, our evening with our families. Father, thank you once again for the privilege of having your word and the privilege of studying your word. And Lord, I just pray that as we, we talk about some of these principles for study, as we move forward into actually digging into a, a book of your word, Lord, we just pray that you would continue to guide, you would continue to teach, equip us, prepare us, uh, help us to grow and sharpen us in our understanding, our application of your word, so that we can be more and more every day a little bit more like you than we were yesterday. Father, thank you for this time together tonight. Thank you for those that joined via Zoom. Thank you for those that are joining via YouTube. And Lord, I just pray your blessing on us as a church family as we seek to carry your message of hope to this community. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We pray it in Jesus' name. All right, guys. Well, good night. Thank you for joining me tonight. And uh, we will see you guys on Sunday.